welcome to spiritual civilization my name is Robbie Omol or Robinson Omol um I'm here with my brothers uh, Leli Mandela Mandela and Reverend Richard Mwendo um this is a wonderful session that we began um a, a few months ago just just to hear and learn the deeper mysteries of the kingdom um this is one desire ministry and uh it is brought to you uh, straight into your living room <laughs> or wherever you're watching from and before we begin and uh before i invite our bishop um i'd like to pray um that our hearts may be open that our eyes may be opened and that we may be able to hear and comprehend each and every single thing that the Lord has for us today. So Father, I commit each and every person watching and listening to this broadcast, oh God. I pray that Lord, you will minister to them. It is nothing that we shall say that will transform, but it is your spirit working through us, through the vo- voice that you have placed in us that will transform that will cause people to understand therefore i speak that word into their lives oh god in jesus mighty name we pray amen um so i'd like to invite our bishop um this is a great man of god i have known him for now 10 years 10 years it is not uh is not a joke and i still admire like it is the first day i i admire the the greatness that he carries like it is the first day so welcome bishop john gobanga um uh, feel free give us everything um i know you move very fast but uh we are tumejika <laughs> kamwa we are ready we are ready for this <laughs> yes <laughs> Karibu. Well, thank you so much uh, Robinson Oluocho Mall. Uh ladies and gentlemen, once again we have an opportunity to just gather together uh to spend time in fellowship, relationship and communion uh with the gentlemen that are here. Uh 10 years ago these guys were in campus and uh 10 years later on they are all married. I only two of them are fathers um but uh, Rob is not yet a father but I believe he's a father in the making uh g- going by certain proceedings that I'll not even want to share yes but otherwise uh, we thank God that uh, we are able to to meet together and just um, fellowship and discuss a few things here and there I want to us to look at a subject the ethos of reality the ethos of reality all right that's what we want to uh, discuss uh you know the, there's this word that is normally used in the bible uh blasphemy people talk of blasphemy people whereby um you hear of uh, Jesus uh, saying that when you blaspheme against the father and the son it shall be forgiven but when you blaspheme against the holy spirit it shall not be forgiven and uh, in looking at this word one thing that i got to discover is that the highest form of blasphemy is religion you know I I say so because religion is man's vain attempt to live independent of God. Religion is what causes a human being to assume a form of godliness rather than experience and embrace the reality of godliness. Uh remember that uh when we talk about godliness you need to understand that uh, godliness is supposed to become man's embodiment of Christ that transforms you from within to without so friends 
religion is the highest form of blasphemy as far as I'm concerned. I don't know how you'd probably uh, look at it, but, as, uh, but, but from my perspective, I tend to believe that when we talk about blasphemy, we are talking about religion. When you talk about people who are blasphemous, we are talking about them that perpetuate the vanity of religion. People who try to live apart from God. I want us to just probably briefly share on this. I, I would like to hear your, your reactions just to find out uh, what exactly you would actually maybe think of uh, religion. I don't know whether you were once upon a time religious, which is most likely, and whether you're still religious even after being uh, with me for over 10 years, because it's possible, it's, it's, it's possible to, to have people around and about you who are just being religious. I've seen that even in church, whereby you find that you're walking with people and uh, on the surface, they appear to be very godly, very spiritual. You have a good relationship with them. But the truth of the matter is that they only love you with their hearts. I mean, with their mouths, but their hearts are very far away from you. And that means that their love for God is not genuine. And most times, you know, when you want to find out if someone is religious, wait until God sets them up in a situation and that's when that situation reveals exactly who this person is because I tend to believe that one who is spiritual is one who is very constant and not subject to circumstances so over to us here let's open this conversation tell me something about uh, religion or what it means to be religious are you still religious? And to what extent have you been blasphemous insofar as your religiosity is concerned? Because to me, religion is blasphemy. Wow, Bishop, you, you don't start slowly, do you? Uh, no, no, we cannot start slowly. <laughs> we have to run very, very fast. Wow. Uh -huh. from, from, the, from off the bat that the highest form of blasphemy is religion. I think uh, that calls us to a certain level of introspection that we had not thought of before. Uh, we had uh, engaged blasphemy as a far-off scene that cannot affect uh, believers who are very active in the place of service. But what this definition does is that it says that the very people that are very active in the place of service have a tendency to suffer not only being religious but such great blasphemy in the place of God's house. Now when we talk about being independent or man's vain attempt to live independent from God, this builds upon the former sessions that we've had. So if you're joining us uh, and this is the first session of spiritual civilization you've had, please uh, go and track uh, within the YouTube channel. You'll be able to see other episodes that you can be able to log into. And from those episodes, what we were able to learn is that there is a certain locale within the realms of the spirit where you are to be found. That locale was referenced as the revelation of Christ. And by being found in the revelation of Christ, you have to live your life completely dependent. Dependent on God. But you see, religion says that, okay, today, let's not be completely dependent. Let's live one aspect in your life. And this is where the believers often fall short. The problem has never been the very big things it's when it starts to chip away slowly by slowly and if you do an audit ladies and gentlemen joining us from wherever you're joining us you will find out that there has been a continued struggle in your life concerning being religious i have to live my life circumspectively redeeming the times for the days are evil you have to understand that i have to wake up every day 
and ask the Holy Spirit to search within me because the world we live in today has such a great tendency to form monuments out of your independent efforts. They will celebrate your independent efforts much faster than they will celebrate your dependency on God. Let me stop there even as I invite my brothers. Uh, religion is the highest form of blasphemy. Uh, in my own definition, religion is, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, a form of blasphemy that uh, a form of uh, living that denies, or uh, yeah, living that denies the power of God in your life. So every time we live, you know, by our own merit by our own achievements as gauges of uh, spiritual growth rather than the grace of god we are living blasphemous lives <laughs> we are we are basically saying i i have achieved uh, 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 my status in the spirit by my own works rather than by the grace of god and you know that is uh, that is basically what is religion religion is all about yeah it is you know how good am i how uh, everything that uh, how uh, does it make me look more like a christian when i do these things rather than realizing it's the grace of god that it takes you from one level to another and though that, that in my <laughs> so when you say yes uh, blasphemy religion is the highest uh, you know form of blasphemy you are really saying you know the more independent we are from god or from god's grace uh, the more uh, blasphemous we are and the more we exalt ourselves and we make monuments out of ourselves and we make ourselves idols rather than making god god um my perspective um one of the things that uh, comes to mind is um another word for human being is evil <laughs> um because if you when you read the scriptures properly uh one of the things that uh comes out is when god was saying uh, jesus was 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 teaching and he was saying that um if you being evil can give your children good things how much more my heavenly father who is in heaven so I look at I look at uh humanity yeah in in this context that we can we are capable of doing good even when our heart is not in it even when we do not love a person we are still capable of doing good we are still capable of uh, uh ex- exhibiting certain things that make us think that we are walking in the right path that make people think that we're even walking in the right path um yet we we may we we our hearts are really far from it and one of the things that uh really comes out from that statement that blas that religion is the highest form of blasphemy is um for example some just as, uh, something as simple as how can you say you love me this is the father as saying how can you say you love me yet you hate your brother and hate is something that is only discerned deep within the heart it is not something that you can outwardly see i may smile and laugh with you and do good things to you but deep within my heart i hate you and uh, and that's that's now where re- religion really really targets people that you just wash the outside of the cup but inside you're very filthy uh and that is that is why it is it's just great blasphemy yeah that's how i see it <laughs> thank you so much um you know one thing about um religion is that it always uh, motivates you to pursue uh, independence it's like you're trying to uh, you know imply that uh, you need to be 
em emancipated uh, from being held hostage by the laws of God, mm. you know. Mm. Um, and one thing that I've discovered about uh, people who are religious is that not only do they want to be independent from God, but they also want to be independent from fellow men. Mm. You know, to a larger extent, there's the aspect of a religious person pretending to be in fellowship and relationship with people. But when you look at it carefully, most of what we call relationships in the body of Christ, they are not really relationships. They are basically systems and structures that are human modulated on the basis of ensuring that we guard our, you know, an individual guards himself or herself from being hurt. Those are relationships where there's a lot of manipulation and control, you know. Now, when you look at um, the teachings and the lifestyle of Christ Jesus, one thing that stands out is that uh, Jesus Christ showed that when you obey the letter of the law, it's basically a matter of physical action, and that is only as far as it goes. But when you obey the spirit of the law, it requires more than just mere outward actions. Obedience to the spirit of the law basically means that you are involving the attitude of the mind. Okay? And this is where now being circumcised in the heart comes into play. A person who is religious is a person whose heart and mind has never been circumcised. The mind and the heart is governed by the carnal nature. And when you're controlled by the carnal nature, you're basically self-centered and you do not have the consciousness of God. And that is why the spirit of the law is basically to be considered as its perceived intentions. What was the original intention of the law? Okay, Like for instance, we know very well from scripture that God is looking for true worshippers. Worshippers worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that there are no outward uh, exhibitions of worship to be undertaken. It's very important for us to understand that uh, when we approach God in the area of worship, there must be the proper frame of mind. There must be the right kind of attitude. There must be that uh, disposition that is conducive to spirituality. And then also there has got to be, you know, faithfulness to those specific items that God would pinpoint as uh, the proper external acts that are to be performed. Because the other thing we must also realize is that you cannot separate the actions from the intention. Both of them go hand in hand. And that's why when we look at two facets of God's divine will, they basically entail the right action with the right attitude. You see, actions emanate from attitude. Okay? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can only speak, you can only express yourself as a result of the state of your heart as well as also your mind. And that's why God requires that we perform the right actions that would emanate from the right attitude that would, ste that would be steaming from the ideal intentions. Okay? Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. When you look at uh, the teachings of Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount, one thing you discover about the interpretation of the Mosaic Law from Jesus' perspective is that Jesus interpreted the Mosaic Law not according to the letter but according to the Spirit. If I may be, probably just pick uh, one case, maybe we can actually look at this particular scripture um, Leli, you can read for us uh, Matthew chapter 5, 
uh, verse 21 to 22. And then um, uh, Richie, you can read for us the same, same chapter, but from verse 27 to 28. Yeah, let's, let, let's consider those scriptures. Matthew 5 verse 21 You have heard that it was said of those of the of, of old you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment but i say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment and whoever says to his brother raka shall be in danger of the council but whoever says you fool shall be in da- danger of hellfire Okay, okay. Matthew 5 from verse 27 to 28. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who so much as looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, Rob, I would like you to comment in brief about on, on the scripture we've read from um, that chapter, verses 21 to 22. What are your views about this scripture? Um, so, Jesus was bringing forth um, two things. The outward expression of an inward reality. Um, the expression being murder um, comes from a point of somebody has has brooded over anger and it has grown and matured and once it has matured uh, it, it gives birth to murder but Jesus raises the standard of us being able to really dig deep into our hearts and circumcise the the deep parts of our heart because he says that even that anger that undealt with anger uh, the first level was without any cause or you or even you you just speak out uh, a, a negative notion to a person um, out of the anger that burns within you, you have already, you have already fallen short of the glory of God. So, the standard is in 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 what is really deep in the heart. Because I may actually even be angry at Richard right now, but be, just because I am not expressing it does not mean that my heart is in the right place. Which means I am actually walking in religion because I have not dealt with the deep thing that is in my heart. So each and every day we relate, but you find that there's that thing that is within me that is, is, is undealt with. And because I am outwardly showcasing uh, goodness, the reality is that my anger within is what is destroying my, my relationship with God. It is what is destroying my capacity to be able to receive from the Spirit of God. It is destroying my entire life's purpose just because of this one thing that is undealt with in the heart. So it is, it is actually a very heavy truth uh, for us to embrace. Thank you so much. Maybe it's also because of the fact that uh, you don't have the opportunity to manifest full-blown <laughs> murder. Yes. You see? I tend to believe that people who are very angry, uh, the reason why Jesus considers them as guilty of murder is because uh, they don't really have the opportunity to kill. The, the opportunity has not presented itself. You can rest be sure, assured if there was nobody else around and there was no, and there was no law to, of the land to hold them to account. Chances are a lot of a lot of people would have actually been killed. Okay. Because you see, the attitude of being angry or being one who mocks others, that's, that kind of attitude is the one that yields forth anger. Now, w- w- let's look at uh, this other scripture, uh, Richie, tell us. Matthew 5, 27 to 28. Uh, what would you elucidate 
from this scripture um this reminds me of a certain series that was preached in our local assembly known as infinite fellowship ministries called the mystery of sex i remember i was a campus student as you guys have heard uh, when we met bishop i was not uh, bearded as much as you see me right now i was not a father i was not a husband i was just a student so in my place of uh, study uh, i was able to invite a few of uh, my fellow students and we came and we listened to the mystery of sex and you know whenever churches at that time uh, i will not mention the year you might do a deep dive but whenever churches at that time would do series on sex it would be about you know positions you know all these things it would be something to draw forth youths with uh, worldly and uh, very degraded discussions in the context of a church so they were saying that if this discussion comes from the context of a pastor <laughs> then that sanctifies the discussion but you see our local assembly introduced a new perspective a new perspective as you have been listening in today's session we've talked about the soul the attitude within the the mind the posture within the heart and then the disposition within the will that alignment of that soul that is what the mystery of sex touched we were able to realize that how god designed sex was not so much focused on the outward expression as it was on the inward reality that was meant to be the true purpose behind sex i will not go very deep into understanding uh, that mystery uh, if you do want that content you can uh, engage uh, one desire separately but coming back to Matthew chapter 5 from verse 27 to 28 you have to understand that Christ was highlighting that before you manifest anything there is a reality at work within you such that out of the abundance of that reality will you manifest i'm just paraphrasing the verse that says out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks so that is what stands out to me uh, bishop about that scripture yes you know the whole subject of sex is uh, it's quite controversial especially uh, in the body of christ and i remember the time when we did that series uh we were full house you know i saw all sorts of people come and i knew very well why they had actually come they had thought maybe i was going to facilitate uh, uh several ways of people engaging in sex but they didn't know that it was not really to be that yeah uh, they were thinking that i was going to talk about uh, an engagement or whereby it's um, a few minutes of pleasure <laughs> in an uncomfortable position <laughs> you know that thing ever since i heard about it i think i've been laughing <laughs> it's so funny how people define sex anyway we are not here to define about sex we are here to talk about the <laughs> the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law Um you know friends when you indulge in sexual fantasies devoid of the act you're basically fulfilling the letter of the law you're not fulfilling the spirit of it because the spirit of the law requires you to ensure that you deal with the last full desires there we go and as long as you are operating in lust you're not any different from someone who commits adultery in the case of the married you're not different from someone who commits fornication in the case of those who are unmarried and as far as the as the lord jesus christ is concerned obeying the letter of the law but not its spirit is not an option both are very very important okay they are very very important you know when you look at uh, every old testament law and every standard of behavior for the believer it can basically be summed up in what we read in Matthew chapter 22 from verse 37 to 40 the two commandments of love 
love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might and strength, and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, when you look at these two commandments, they basically embody the spirit of the law. Okay? They are the greatest co uh, commandments that express the ultimate point of every other law that is in existence. And there is no, uh, th there is no question about that. And that is why I begin by telling us that, you know, it is time for the church to grow up and go beyond theological explanation. It's time for the church to grow up and go beyond man-made theology about God and man-made explanation of scriptures. Because I discovered that it is possible for you to have your own version of interpretation of the Bible and your own you know, personal theology, if I would put it that way, to the point where you, you, you actually forget that you may end up becoming blasphemous, just as I've actually shared. Because friends, Jesus did not come into this world to continue to perpetuate the theology that was there, the theology that had actually been, uh, been perpetuated by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus came to show us the path to a higher state of consciousness. Okay? Now, the sad bit of it is that after Jesus Christ returned back to the Father, this particular example has actually been destroyed by what we call Christianity. Now, some of you are wondering, what, I, what exactly am I saying? Yes. First of all, we must also get our understanding right. The word Christian is not the biblical definition of a believer. As a matter of fact, the word Christian is a mockery. It is a, der a, a derogatory term that was used to mock those who belonged to the way. So if I asked you whether you're a Christian or a believer, you might wonder whether I'm talking about the same thing. But the truth is, there's a difference between a Christian and a believer. A Christian is one who conforms to the outward forms of being good, living by the Ten Commandments, you know? And once they live by the Ten Commandments, as far as they are concerned, they have kept the law. But as far as the intention as to why they are living by the Ten Commandments is concerned, they fall short of the same. Okay? And that's why it's very important for us to understand that uh, the higher state of, of, of consciousness is something that has been missing in the church for a very long period of time. So what people have actually been perpetuating is blasphemy. And that's why, friends, it is about time that as children of God that we step into the realm of consciousness. This is the realm of awareness where the revelation of Christ as well as the revelation of the Father is actually known. You know, when we um, started going to church, uh, you know, those days when we, we, we used to attend uh, uh, Sunday school, we were given the Bible and we used to interpret the Bible literally. And probably even at some point when, maybe when some of you got saved, you used to read the Bible literally. And you, and, 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 and you see, it's later on that you, come, you, you came to, to realize that there's a lot of allegorical approach insofar as the interpretation of Scripture is concerned. But friends, we must understand, God has not called us to be a kind of people who submit to a mere book which basically is a volume of about 66 publications written by different human authors who are, carried, who are moved as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit within a duration of 1,500 years. No, that is not the reason why we did the Bible. God wants us to understand that the, that the content of the Bible has a source. There is a genesis which actually is the source of what we read in the Bible. And this source is basically within each and every one of us. That's the truth of the matter. If you are a Christian 
or rather if you are a believer because we've agreed we do not want to use the word Christian if you are a believer you are saved you're born again your spirit filled and your spirit led that is if at all each and every one of you submits to the holy spirit then that means that you have the source of your origin that is within you and it is from that fountain it is from that well spring it is from that source that you are actually supposed to derive your understanding as to what the word of god says okay it is very important to come to a place whereby we appreciate the fact that the bible is not supposed to be taken as a literal book one thing that i've come to discover even from my own personal experience is that you can never grow in any way when you take the scriptures literally you will remain stunted you will memorize scripture from head to toe from genesis to revelation from lamentation to exodus word by word to the point where by you're even able to cite where the commas are and yet you have no understanding as to what the scriptures are actually saying friends you must go beyond the letter of the law the letter of god's word and discover what exactly was god intending and these are things that you're able to derive from within yourself because beloved one thing that i got to discover is that when you try to live by the outward law the outward letter of the law if i may put it that way you basically produce a life that is controlled by religious spirits You know we see a lot of wickedness in the world today and one thing that I've discovered beloved a lot of people are possessed by religious spirits and religious spirits they are as diabolic as every other spirit very diabolical okay and to prove that you'll find that in different parts of the world we've got actually people who are religious fundamentalists mm. okay it's just the same 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 thing you know it's it, you know it's possible for us to condemn muslims and say that these guys they are extremists in so far as uh, pursuing their their religious agenda is concerned but i want to submit to us the same 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 nature is also within them that call themselves christians Maybe the maybe the difference could be that Christians may not be very very extreme or zealous in executing their zeal for their faith but if you look at the history of the church during the dark ages you you've you've heard about the crusade uh, wars that were there I don't have time to talk about that Now friends one thing that I've discovered is that religious fundamentalism is basically a state whereby you insist on a literal interpretation of the sacred writings rather than the symbolic representation of spiritual thoughts mm. and that's how you find that there are certain people especially even in the body of Christ let's not even talk about muslims and indians let's talk about ourselves we who are believers you'll find that we, within within our own ranks we've got people who have actually formed certain sects and certain segments within Christendom that justify their suspicion they justify their hate and killing of others who do not belong to their faiths i'm sure you for those of you who are actually following the proceedings of this broadcast you're very much uh, acquainted with what has been happening in certain parts of the world whereby people have actually been fighting along denominational lines that's true you know Most of the times when you, when you find people fighting in this particular instance is because they want to insist that what they believe is better than others. The reason why denominations are there is because you find that one denomination exalts a particular doctrine over and above the rest. And that is religious fundamentalism. You know it's very very important to understand When you see the events of the Bible and you t- uh, and, 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 and and when you consider such kind of events as though they are taking place within the natural realm they know very well that that is fundamentalism 
In fact, I would want to say that the literal understanding of scripture is carnal. Hey. It kills you and it also kills other people. If you want to read and study the Bible literally, if you love it, you will basically miss something that is very, very important. Very, very important. If you want to get the right interpretation of scripture to the point whereby you are able to unlock the mystical code of scripture, then you, not, you really need to go within, not without. It's very, very important. You must realize the, 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 the oneness of God's word with divine grace. Because sometimes, you know, you are able to, you, you may find yourself reading scripture without grace. You must come to the place whereby you are able to hear the voice of God who is the I am. Whereby you know very well that the more you hear the proceeding word of God, you are able to perceive that particular truth. Lady, uh, gentlemen, I almost said something <laughs> and I'm happy that I dodged that. Uh, beloved gentlemen, can we have a conversation around about that? Thanks, Bishop, for that. What stands out for me the most <laughs> is that there are very many believers. Okay, let me say, because you've defined the contrast between believers and Christians, there are very many churchgoers before I'm able to be called one who judges. But there are very many churchgoers who think that they read scripture yet they are religious fundamentalists these are those that have the loudest voice when it comes to spiritual questions questions that border on morality they are always the first to comment uh, questions that border on um, the goodness or the character of God they are always the first to comment Yet you find that when you do an interrogation of these individuals, they do not have any mandate to make any comment on any of the aforementioned subjects. And it is because they lack the true understanding of scripture. The first thing, if you engage these people, they will tell you that the Bible means basic instructions before leaving earth. Yet, when we are taught by Christ Jesus, he lived his life not only here on earth, but also in eternity. That is why he always went to, into the mountains to retreat. That was his place of prophetic actualization of reality. And he would be able to touch base with that reality in eternity, such that by the time he steps on earth in the day that is that day, that reality is made on earth as it is in heaven. You have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible, if read as a historical account, if read as a testimony of how you should live your life only in the natural, we have just learned that that does not constitute reading the Bible. Reading the Bible is decoding the mystical code behind its reality because behind the bible is a reality that unites these different authors testimonies over a course of 1500 years brothers in other words um it's important for us to uh, understand something that as a believer you live on earth but you actually dwell in heaven Your habitat is in heaven, yeah. if I may put it that way. So the only reason why you're living on earth is to manifest heaven. Yeah. Yeah, let's go on with the conversation. Uh, uh, on this subject of religion and uh, scripture, um, one thing you discover about uh, a reading the scriptures of the Bible religiously is that you you never meet the word. Uh, let me put it this way. <laughs> uh, the Bible said uh, uh, 
he sent his word and he healed his, uh, my disease so it means god sent a person called the word <laughs> so that person came and even in john one says uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god so when you are religious you you never see that person when you are reading you never see that person called the word when you are reading the text or the scriptures or the bible whichever you put it that way so because you are not <laughs> you are not able to perceive that person in that text you are not able to uh, draw life out of the text you are reading uh, because it is life is given birth to by a person <laughs> uh, of course you became a baby because your parents met each other you did not become a baby because your parent met a book <laughs> so because uh, you know if you're religious you're always meeting a book and never another person so you're not able to give you are not able to draw forth life from the texts and you're not able to draw forth a certain reality of living from reading the scriptures so th- that uh, that is the question for you if you're religious and you are uh, leading r- reading the bible literally uh, uh, as as you said then the text will just be a story if you are reading it by the spirit of god you start realizing this is a certain reality that god is calling me into yeah that's what i have to say at the moment before even i go you know i had people say that um God speaks to me you hear somebody saying that God speaks to me through the bible that I live by the bible so there are times I like to be a little bit uh, cheeky <laughs> where I ask so does the bible have a mouth uh, does does the bible have eyes can the bible in and of itself bring life you know I keep asking people and you'll hear somebody saying where well, the spirit of God leads me into all truth so they to them they believe that truth is what they read in scripture now the truth of the matter is that the scriptures are very accurate and yes there's an there's an extent in which the bible is truth that is true but the question is in terms of transformation can the bible as the book transform you or is it the word that transforms you the very very word that the bible talks about you know that has been the argument that we have a lot of times and and you know in, in some in some instances you find that there's been a lot of controversy as, as to whether god can speak to they via a word of prophecy and they tell you the only prophecy that you get to hear is 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 is, is, is what we read from scripture and my understanding is that the bible is It's a book of prophetic writings. It is uh, the standard of faith and conduct for Christian living. Yes. But um unfortunately, there are things that the Bible cannot tell me. Like for instance, the Bible doesn't specify where I should live. You see, I live in this house not because I read about this house in scripture. Um I'm wearing this black shirt not because I read about it in scripture. Okay? So how am I able to come to the place where even when there are certain things that I may not necessarily see in scripture, I can actually say that I have been led by God into doing something. And when you look at the leading itself when you look at the execution and the fruit of that leading it is it is a fruitfulness that is in agreement with scripture so how do we balance all that because as far as i'm concerned the bible as a book cannot speak to me because i asked somebody that question in fact he was a theologian and he could not give me an answer i asked him okay does your bible sp- that, i mean can it speak to you right now can you get your bible so that it speaks to you So it's almost taking it personal. So what are, what have you people to say? Um one of the things that I've I've, I've gotten to grasp even from to uh, to a point to answer your question is that when we study the Bible uh we learn, right? We are learning. But 
God's intention is for us to have an impartation rather than lessons because you can you may have lessons like I learned chemistry in high school and I got a serious D plus uh and currently I am doing uh I'm doing I'm an I'm a graphic designer I'm an artist I'm, a, I'm also a musician and I am the lessons that I learned in the four years of high school in chemistry I am not using any of those lessons but uh and 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 that is the case like when when we stick to the letter of the law because um there is there is the studying of the works of god but there is another dimension that you must enter into where you understand the ways of god and where by understanding the ways of god it's what uh my brother leli was sharing about uh the bible being uh, a book and the word being a person and when you begin to interact with the person you begin to understand the ways of god and to answer now uh, what bishop was asking when you begin to understand the ways of god and walk as you walk with him that is where you find the reality of how to make decisions how to think how your heart should palpitate with the vibrations of life there, there is a there's a way that um you won't even I, i i find many people struggle uh with 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 the work and it is because of this very thing that we are talking about it is because you have not grasped the reality the ethos of reality of uh, and, and 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 that causes you to 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 struggle every day today I will not last. Tomorrow I will not last. <laughs> and you may say these things, you may say and chant and and uh, begin and quote scripture and do everything. I am more than a conqueror. But if you have not interacted with the word, the man, the Christ himself, if he is not part and parcel of your life, if he is not your greatest treasure, to the point where you have surrendered all things and he has become the lord then um you're just be- you're just a religious person and you will never begin to understand the ways of god thank you so much you know unless you have been awakened to come to the place where you are enlightened to a place where by you you know you you have had an experiential encounter with the, the spiritual state whereby you have the consciousness of the divine trust me all spiritual teachings will remain here see and they are prone to distortion they are prone to misunderstanding in fact let me say this not everything we hear is gospel in church today Not everything we read in books is gospel. You see unless we are made to hear the gospel message beyond literalism. Unless we read the Bible beyond just being literal. Trust me, the yoke of the law will not be broken in your life. When I talk about the yoke what do I mean? I'm talking about the yoke of false human consciousness okay that consciousness of your humanity that keeps dictating and modulating your life and telling you how to be a good christian live by the 10 commandments don't abuse anybody don't do this and that obey the law of the land and you know friends those things they are not bad in the in and of themselves to be an obedient person is good But if you're not having the motivation from within yourself to obey, if there's nothing that is motivating you to obey, then as far as God is concerned, you're not living by the spirit of the law. That's the truth of the matter. So, every human consciousness that is devoid of the spiritual reality has got to be dissolved in your life. You know, when I look at the Bible, It contains not only records of physical activities. 
the bible contains metaphors of inner life passages okay <laughs> they occur as a way to awaken an individual to the kingdom of god that is within themselves you see until there's an awakening within you until you come to the place whereby there is a certain dimension of consciousness that you are able to touch base within the summit of your heart then all you'll just be engaging in is going through the motions or a particular program that makes you feel good but it doesn't necessarily imply that you're spiritual that's very very important you know whatever is a seemingly outward physical activity that we actually read in the bible especially if, it, if if let's say it's a spiritual activity or rather a physical activity of uh, of a story that we've actually derived in scripture we must consider what it means to our inner process of spiritual breakthrough we must see it as though it is carrying a message behind the outer story because friends whatever we read in that is physical it's basic it basically becomes symbolic of something that is deeper that requires an intuitive interpretation that's very important now if i may probably slightly digress in the realms of the spirit or in the realms of god there is no such a thing as a shift or change yeah. In the natural uh-huh. <laughs> we talk about change we talk about a shift but in the realms of God there is no change because God the Father is already within you and he is everything so beyond him who is in you there can never be change okay and therefore if God the Father is within you then there is really no need to shift but it is your conscious mind that is awakening it is your conscious mind that is ascending to an inner reality of the divine it is that mind that you have that is renewed by that awareness and therefore we refer to it as, as a shift but as far as the realms of god are concerned there is no such a thing as a shift that's the truth of the matter You see when the Bible tells us um, especially in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 14 awake thou that sleepeth and arise from the dead that Christ shall give thee light this is not referring to what is going on within you it basically talks about the mind it is the mind that needs to shift when the mind shifts what happens is it will it will automatically align with the summit of your heart I hope that is not so hard for you to understand. You know, when we keep seeking for the light of truth, we must learn to wait for, at a personal level. We must learn to wait upon God in order for us to be able to receive that inward revelation of truth and our oneness with him. You know, when you talk about us seeking the light of God, Let's understand something. The light of God is not a thing that God is going to give us. The light of God is God himself. So if we are talking about receiving light from God, you're basically saying receiving God because the Bible says he is light. Okay? He is actually light. We don't say, you know when when we say that we want life from God. God does not give you life, neither does he give you love. as a thing or as, a, or as an item that there is light so i go to where that screen is and i take that thing and i say now nah, have light no god gives himself if it is life life is not this camera that is here god himself is life okay truth is not that every receiver that is there truth is god so when you have god you have everything The Lord is my shepherd I shall not want In other words I have everything that I need Okay God is life God is uh, is 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 light he is love And the more we have God within our own consciousness 
then we have everything that we need. What do you guys think? Hey, Bishop, things are now flying at a supernova speed. One thing he has said, uh, allow me to paraphrase what he has said. Because uh, I'd also like to rebuke those believers that hang on to every word of every man and woman of God who is anointed. Understand that you have to hear it in its reality format and then translate it according to your designation, according to your revelation of Christ. So what I will say has not been captured word for word by Bishop, but it is the same thing. He said that provision is not the movement of resources. It is the ascension of man into a higher reality of God in his consciousness. Hey, I'm telling you, this is madness. <laughs> so for me to receive of the provision of God, I don't need to try and track the movement of resources. That is um, something within the realm of manifestation. Resources, as we learned in one of the other episodes of spiritual civilizations, resources have an innate GPS system that track the purpose of God. So they have an inbuilt transportation mechanism to move towards God's purpose. So what I need to do in terms of, res of provision is not to track resources because resources will come. What I need to do is track God because God needs to be provided within me. Now, how is God provided within me? It is when within my consciousness, as we have learned, there's no movement in the spirit. It is within my consciousness when I ascend from a base kernel perspective to a higher dimension where God and I are in relationship, fellowship and communion with his purpose, then I have received provision. Hmm. I think you should have actually been the one who's, who's facilitating because now it's like I feel I'm being enlightened afresh. God. Oh my God. Eh? Beloved, I think Cardinal needs to be the one doing this. That, you know, that's why he's called Cardinal. You know? Yeah, you know, he's the dean of the African Cathedral. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know where to start after that. <laughs> well, there's no, there's no movement in the spirit. There's only an elevation of your consciousness. Uh, uh, you know, just everything that has been said, that's, that's, what, that's what we can say. Because, you know, uh, if God is perfect and everything is in a perfect state, then if something is in a perfect state, it doesn't need to be moved again. When you try to move it beyond its perfection, that is religion, that's blasphemy. Hey. Hey. <laughs> or better still, that is high level of wizardry. Witchcraft. Because that's why, you know, there's a time we were debating and we were asking, can you be perfect? You know, I was debating that you can actually be perfect. And I, you know, the more I, I, I read about it, because Jesus told, told us to be perfect as uh, uh, you know to be perfect when and of course Christ cannot say something that is not attainable mm. so he's saying uh, <laughs> in that perfected state there's no when you're perfect you're now changing from and uh, doing a lot of, but when you're in, in that perfected state you are as the word says and the, what the word says is the person who is in the second heavens because that person in the second heavens has already been perfected by the word so the word of God is introducing you to that person in the second heavens in the hope that that word will elevate your consciousness to think as the person in that heavens. Have you ever, <laughs> sorry to interject, Lily. Have you ever heard how religious people talk? I'm a mere human being. Yeah. I'm just, I keep on going to the cross. So don't judge me. We are all human. You're also not perfect. Don't judge me and so on. That is blasphemy. That is what we call wizardry. That is witchcraft. That's divination. Trying to manipulate everybody to conform to what you want because of the fact that you're struggling in sin, you're struggling in your weaknesses, so you want to justify that 
by saying that every other person is going through it. Now listen here. If you're if you're struggling with witchcraft, I am not struggling. <laughs> you know? If 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 you're struggling to forgive, my friend, me, I forgive people before they offend me. Oh my god, if you have if you have got issues of bitterness, that is your problem, that is your funeral. So please don't put me in your mess. I also have to deal with mine. All I just need to do is to do what? To adjust my consciousness. Go on, Lily. <laughs> so when Christ was saying uh, uh, be perfect is saying you, you should be in concert with that person in the second heavens. Uh, because in the second heavens the reality there is the word. <laughs> But that is when you are born again as Christians we are now trying to conform to that reality and there's a point that Christ says you can come to this point where you can be in concert with the word perfectly. And uh, when you are at that point you are you are no longer looking for change again because a perfect man is not looking for change a perfect man is in, in is existing in a state of uh, without any encumbrances or hindrances towards fulfilling the purpose of God a perfect man basically is one who is uh, basically tapping into the pristine element of his identity he's not doing anything that is strange yeah. he's basically perpetuating the truest essence of his origin yeah. and it all takes it 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 takes it takes an adjustment here You see that when the Bible says that you shall be transformed by the renewal of your mind in other words your consciousness must be elevated to that place where you have divine consciousness yeah. it is divine consciousness that will cause every aspect of you to align with your pristine identity no wonder that's why whenever we give people rema words they begin to fight You tell somebody that hey God is saying this and they begin to fight because the problem is here. Instead of trusting God for you to be able to grasp exactly what he's saying and have the understanding and submit to the counsel, you lean on your own understanding. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> there's that place of perfect divine consciousness which is what everyone is looking for. If you look at Hindus, Buddhists, if is they're looking for that place of divine consciousness meaning if they're looking for that and they're aware of that then it means us christians are the most religious so re- religious ones because we are not looking for that state hey, hey. <laughs> we are looking to perpetuate weaknesses human uh, frailties and justifying every wrong doing isn't it yes uh, we steal from the public coffers and then we run to church to to find defense When you when you're called to account you point fingers and say well but even so and so is doing that you know Christians are very good at doing that mm. they say why are you asking me and not so and so instead <laughs> of taking responsibility mm. yeah so <laughs> as I'd say we are being called to a higher place of being men who are totally in control of their souls because a perfect man is not once you're in control of your soul because your soul is the resident of your mind and your emotions and your will you're in total control of yourself which is you know what Christ is talking about when we were in Matthew 5 so that is the place and that is the reality we are being we are being called to and let me stop there wow i like that you guys should have been the ones facilitating <laughs> Hmm? I think we are going to do one whereby I'll be seated there and we'll be rotating so, so so that one of you or all of you sit here because you seem to be sharing very wonderful things. Yes, Rob. Wow. In the realms of God there is no change, there is no shift. That is why um God is the adjustment to all in harmonious circumstances. The 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 thing there's a comedian who who once uh, made a joke that his cousin was arrested for selling drugs and he was uh, the judge made the pronouncement that he would be imprisoned for i think five to i, I don't know if it was five or ten years and the christians were the first ones 
to make noise to cry to wail to to be in like in turmoil and he was using that example to to say that christians are the ones who are meant to be very prepared or ready for the storm yet <laughs> when the storm comes they are the ones who are most affected by the storm my goodness. My goodness. <laughs> so i i look at such situations and i'm like um where where is the where is the work that is happening within us as believers when circumstances problems and scenarios occur around us how are we to respond in such a way that the purpose of god uh, is fulfilled because again in god there is no shift there is no change meaning that transitions are a way of life in the spiritual realm yet we we encounter tra- tra- uh, transitions as though they have shocked us um somebody uh, somebody gets cancer and it comes as a shock to us as though that transition of now having to deal with a loved one who is who is terminally ill is uh is is not something that 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 was already factored in in the purpose of god um i i i i see these things and i'm i'm able to see how there is that we are supposed to have such a consistency in our walk in our response which is which is worship in our um posture in how we respond to things there's supposed to be such a consistency to the point where we are seen as the solution bearers to all things here on earth that is that is why we we ought not to uh live live on earth um i remember when when we were studying about uh, jesus when john and andrew i think it was john and andrew who approached jesus and said and asked him where do you live and he said come 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 and see come and see and when he said that i, I stuck there for some time and the holy spirit began to teach me that when when that jesus um his home is a place where you have to follow and you have to open your eyes you have to arise your consciousness must go up to see that statement come and see that was written in 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 the gospel of john is not just come and see atika kuja nifuate let's go let's go here no it is come follow me follow my example be imparted by by the things that i carry see my life and embrace it and 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 walk in it and live as as i live and see begin to see open your eyes your consciousness must rise up must go beyond uh, this this false human consciousness that we have uh, because of the fallen nature and 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 embrace who you really are this is where the rich man even also um failed because he asked for it he asked for it he he knew that there is there's something there's a there's a higher consciousness that will enable me to be above anything and any any situation any circumstance and be able to acquire any provision that is 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 meant for me for this life that i am living and beyond so that was that's what he was asking when he said what must i do to attain to eternal life but he failed at the last moment where jesus was saying come and see which is follow me and leave everything that you have because that's the only way that you can attain to that higher consciousness yes you know friends 
Um, once again, I would want to say there is no change in the realms of the spirit. The only thing that needs to shift is the consciousness of your mind. Now, when you go through storms in life, the reason is because those storms are supposed to register a certain adjustment of your mindset insofar as the reality that you carry within yourself that needs to be allowed to expand, that needs to be allowed to find expression. There's a certain divine reality that you carry within yourself that is of God. There's the idea of purpose that is in you, but to a larger degree, it is being impeded by the storms of the negative aspects that come as a result of uh, the inclination of your flesh. You see, when, when you have issues within you that you've never dealt with, those issues will frustrate the purpose of God, which is basically the continuum of divine consciousness that is within you. And you know, th the continuum of divine consciousness is immutable. It is not subject to what is going on outside. But most times we always tend to have this feeling that whatsoever is within us needs to adjust as a result of what is going on on the outside. And the truth of the matter is that there is nothing, there is nothing within, your, within your being that is supposed to adjust. What needs to adjust is your understanding, your ability to interpret your outward circumstances and challenges as a, as, as a way of you being able to have an opportunity to address the very, very things that are within you that are hindering God's purpose being made manifest in your life. If you remember, for those of you who've been following this broadcast, I shared uh, some weeks ago that uh, the reasons as to why we experience opposition in life is because the opposition we have is as a result of the war between the purpose of God that within yourself and your fleshly desires. Yes. So that fight between the purpose of God and your fleshly desires is what brings forth negative energy. And the negative energy that is resident within yourself is what generates the kind of environment that you experience that, that, that appears to be in opposition to you. When you find people who arise in opposition towards you, it's because there is a degree of negativity that is vested within you that needs to be addressed. Now, unfortunately, God is not going to address certain things in your life. He expects of you to address those particular things within your life. And um, I remember sharing um, in a forum at 3 a.m. Uh, yesterday morning that uh, when you are at a place whereby you expect the fountain of life which basically is the reservoir of divine consciousness to begin to flow from within yourself, it will take your submission and honor to God. Now, what is it that you're submitting to? You are submitting to the counsel of his word. What is the counsel of God's word? You're basically submitting to the spiritual reality. You're basically submitting to a certain aspect of flow and to the point whereby your submission and your honor is what will drill the fountain of life from within yourself. Because friends, the solutions that you require insofar as your life is concerned will never be found from without. It is found from within. Mm. And how that comes about is when you humbly submit yourself and you honor God. You see, submission is one arm. Honor is another arm. Now, your submission and your honor for God must lay hold of the drill of his word. Okay? So that the more you submit, the more the word of God begins to do what to drill. Because the Bible says the word of God is a double-edged sword. 
not the scriptures the word of god the word of god is a double edged sword the principle of god the very very principle that causes god to be god that sustains god the very very principle which the bible says he has exalted his word above himself that is what you submit to because when you do not submit to god and you do not honor god you're basically going against his word that is what you are supposed to do what to drill within your being now what is it that you're drilling you're basically drilling you're, you're drilling to root out everything that is of the flesh every form of hindrance until such a point whereby you tap into the fountain of divine consciousness that is within the element of your being because within the reservoir of your being or your pristine identity that is where there is life as uh, stand by even as we look forward to part 2 it's been very wonderful thank you <music>